Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 20 of True Crime All the Time. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in true crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you today? Hey, man, I'm doing well. That's awesome. Yeah. I always like to hear that you're doing well. Is there any other way to be? Well, I don't know. At some point, you're going to say, I'm not doing well, and then I don't know what to say. Watch out for everybody around me. (laughs) Then I'll be worried. (laughs) So, Gibby, I want to start out with a clip today, and it'll kind of lead us right into the case. Let's do that. Well, I can only go by what um, the guys said at trial because they were the ones that were inside the house. So, um, according to them, they waited for my husband to come home, and one of them, there were two in the house, and one of them shot him and killed him. Bill said that I told him to do everything. He said that he was supposed to make it look like a burglary and kill my husband. As they're saying that he was manipulated by me, but at the same time, he, he manipulated his friends to go along and do this with him. And none of them said that I told them to do this. And they all testified at the trial that they all did it because he told them to. All the conversations they had about the murder they had with, with um, him, not with me. And um, they said that uh, one of them said that they did it for him because they, didn't, they thought he was going to get caught and they wanted to help him. So I think a lot of listeners are going to recognize that voice as Pamela Smart. Yeah. I mean, huge case. And it's kind of what, where I want to start with the fact that, you know, this was the first trial ever fully televised, which was a huge deal. Oh, absolutely. It, I think it really, it, and again, this was pre OJ. So it kind of ushered in this whole phenomena of trial watching, right? Which became, I mean, even to this day, if there's a trial on, people get glued to it. You know, whether you're talking about Jody Arias or, you know, K- uh, Casey Anthony, any of these that have come down the pike. And obviously, OJ was huge. But this kind of started all of that. And, you know, to me, our last couple episodes have been really dark, right? We've been talking about really dark, really dark. Yes. It, serial killers that have, you know, killed numbers of people. And I'm not making light of this case at all, because as we heard in the clip, and and a lot of people are going to be familiar with this case, a man ends up dead. You know, we have a victim. At the same time, you have one spouse involved in some form or another of the the killing of the other spouse. That happens a lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is not a unique situation. No, but it's... It's just because this is the first time all of America is watching it. I think that has a lot to do with it. Now, you've got the teacher-student taboo relationship. Which which was kind of the kickoff of that in America, too, right? I, I mean, I'm guessing it probably always kind of has happened, but this is the first time that it's in the mainstream media and we're hearing about this... You know, yeah, we hear about a lot student teacher, you know, coming after this. So, you know, you've got the whole nation is kind of glued to this case about one killing. But look at some of the episodes that we do where these people are committing just unbelievable acts and the body count is so high. Yeah. It doesn't get anywhere near the coverage of this. No, and, it and might get some local regional, but yeah, it's, it's somewhat fascinating yeah. to, to take a look at this case and see, you know, you had a, 150 reporters over 150 yeah. converge in New Hampshire to cover this case in 1990. I'm trying to remember Mike at that time. Was it really that many actual TV, I mean, we were just still having the major three t- networks and not a lot of cable networks at that time. No, we had a lot of cable. Now. We, I mean, then, not, not to the extent we have today. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole different world now. But you know what I don't know is whether or not they had court TV. Huh. I don't think they did because this was televised locally on like Channel 9 or something. But we had, it, court, TV, court TV came around about the time OJ. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. But I think this might have been maybe part of the impetus for court TV. Well, I bet because the the amount of people that were 
talking about it, watching it. I mean, if you were in that business, you probably said, well, this is something that people will sit home and watch watch all day long. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about like, we like to do, you know, the early life of Pam Smart. She was born Pamela Ann Wojcic in Coral Gables, Florida on August 16th, 1967. Second of three children. She had a sister, Elizabeth, who was six years older than she was. And then she had a brother, John, that was three years younger than she was. Her father was a commercial airline pilot and her mom worked as a part-time legal secretary. Now, when Pam was in elementary school, the family moved to Wyndham, New Hampshire, and Pam went to high school in Derry, New Hampshire, and she was a cheerleader. Now, a lot was made of that back because, again, you know, she was painted as this black widow husband killer, and a lot of a lot of it was built on like some salacious things. Sure. I think there were some photos that came out early oh, on. Famous white bikini photos. Yeah, and I think that turned out to be, if I remember, it was her and her friend were going to enter some kind of competition, so they had taken pictures of each other. It really wasn't as salacious, I think, as what it was portrayed to be. Yeah, but once it's leaked out to the media, the pictures come out, the perception, oh, right? Yeah. And the news stories that would run with it. And I think that's what a lot of this... You know, a lot of people, and let's just say it, right? There are a ton of people that think Pam Smart is guilty as can be, but there is a subset of people. Sure. And you can find whole websites dedicated to the fact that she's an innocent person. Yeah, I think they they would say if if this occurred in today's world, would she would the outcome be the same? And I don't know how it wouldn't be. Uh, you know, based on the trial testimony and everything that I know, but obviously we can revisit that yeah. at the end <laughs> after we go through everything. Yeah, I, I think the, the, I would reverse that question. I would say, or not reverse it, but I would say, would the outcome been different if we didn't have the media uproar that she went through? If it was two years earlier, would she have ended up in the same situation? Well, I think that's I, don't know. I think that's what you have a lot of people saying is she was convicted in the media before the trial even started. started. But you still had a jury of her peers and and again, we'll get on right. we'll get into all that, but you know, like I said, she was a cheerleader after high school, she went to college at Florida State and you know, by all accounts, she was very smart. Yeah. You she, know, graduated really I think in 3 years. 1988, she had pretty close to a four-point grade point average. Pretty good IQ. Yeah. You know, one thing I did find very fascinating about Pam Wojcic at this time was that she was really into heavy metal music. So much so that, I mean, she had like wanted that to be her career. She had taken like broadcasting and, and she actually did this radio show at Florida state. Really? And it was called metal madness. And she called herself the maiden of metal. So here's this. And anybody has seen, has seen pictures of her. She's very petite, blonde. Doesn't look to me like the maiden of metal. Right. At all. And I think people had said, you know, when they actually found out who it was, they were shocked. They, they expected it to be somebody that was much more outlandish looking than what Pam was. Right. She was a petite little. The one thing about Pam is, and we talk about this a lot. I don't think she grew up in a bad home. I don't think she had a bad childhood. I didn't find anything. No. That led me to believe that, you know, she had precursors. Or, or things that we talk about in a lot of cases. Pretty normal life. Yeah. But there were some signs, even from her, she would say that, you know, she had to be the center of everything. And these are direct statements. Right. You know, by Pam. And basically saying, everywhere I go, 
I'm always attracting attention. I'm loud. I'm outgoing. And I need to be the center of everything. Kind of fame hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Or egocentric or whatever you want to call it. There was something else that I read that talked about she was very compulsive in, in so much that she had to organize her clothes by color in her. So this was like early stage OCD. A little. I mean, it sounds like that a little bit, but, you know, had to every she even folded her dirty laundry. Well, I did that growing up, too, though. Did you really? I did. Jeez, I was OCD. That's, yeah, that's a little. I mean, I'm confused. My mom. It's dirty. You just throw it in the hamper. I just wanted to look neat. Okay. So let me ask you this. Did you do this? Because this is what Pam did. She not only folded the dirty laundry, she had one hamper for whites, dirty, and one hamper for darks, all folded up. I didn't go that far. All right. She beat you then. We make fun of that a little bit, but she lived her life that way in a very organized fashion. To the point where it was said that she would become very upset when any part of her schedule was disrupted. You know, she liked things very regimented the way she liked them. Yeah. And if they didn't go that way, she would become very upset. Kind of like that movie with Julia Roberts when the, her husband liked the towels and the cans turned turned all the cans sleeping with the enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not sure this isn't that much different, but in, but in reverse in reverse. So we got to talk about Greg Smart because, you know, it's no secret. Everybody knows Greg Smart is the victim here. And Greg was born on September 4th, 1965. He grew up in Nashua, New Hampshire. He had a brother. And again, I think he grew up in just a a really nice, loving, loving home, had a great upbringing. I couldn't find anything negative about Greg at all. I think everybody loved Greg. Yeah. He was outgoing, good looking guy had, I mean, if you see pictures of Greg, he had this, I could only describe it as a glorious mane of hair. Now, you know, I'm jealous about hair. You should be. Cause <laughs> I have very little <laughs> in certain regions, Yeah, but he had just like eighties rocker glam, hair yeah when he was young yeah Yeah. i mean i think he was into heavy metal music as well yeah iron maiden and he looked the part i mean he looked like a he could like be the lead singer yeah like a 1980s metal band singer he had that kind of hair and it was glorious did he wear the tight pants too i did not see that okay did not see that that's good it's kind of what brought pam and greg together her love for heavy metal there yeah i mean then he looked the part yeah they met at a party they weren't they were still in their teens, I think, when they met. And this was a New Year's Eve party. Yeah. Ra- you know, 1986, probably going into 1987. It was their shared passion of heavy metal music and his look. I think she was really, she saw him and just, she that melted. was it. She melted. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm sure there was a lot the other way, too. He saw her and... You know, it was an instant. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a two-way. Yeah, an instant thing. But, you know, he he played guitar a little bit. He was into heavy metal music. He looked the part. So did he play the guitar good like you play yours? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch of guitars sitting over here that I can't play. Like they look nice. One single bit. They look nice. I can play chords and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, again, there's not a lot out uh, you know, not a lot about Greg and, and you and I, it's one thing we kind of like to do. We don't want to forget the victim because right. Greg is the victim in this situation. And that's one thing we never want to do. And I, and I think even in this trial, right in this media frenzy, he gets lost in the shuffle. I think he does, you know, because it, it becomes a circus Yeah, it, and it becomes all about Pam. It comes about Pam, the teenage sex, yep, all the things we're going to talk about what it should be. And, and I think that's kind of the sad thing that you see in a lot of cases is that the victim gets lost. Yes. Now, obviously, we're going to be talking about Pam the, the most. Sure. Because that's kind of where the story leads us. But, you know, we just didn't want to forget about him. And we, we don't. We said they, they meet New Year's Eve, 1986, really 1987. 
Yeah, and, around February '87, they're kind of getting serious. Yeah, yeah, they're they're hot and heavy and serious, and and really within what couple years they're married. Yeah, they're hitched. And as newlyweds, they seem to be you know this great couple, two young, good looking people, prime of their life, getting ready to go do these great things. And I think Pam at one time even described her life with Greg to other people as picture perfect. And that's a, you know, quote again, I'm using air quotes that nobody he, can see. He does that a lot. I, I do like, he to uses them wrong though. You know, Greg is this kind of described as like a free spirit, really fun loving. And Pam is described as, you know, at this point, a 23 year old, just real vivacious and perky and outgoing as well. They even had this little quirk that they would do and and it had something to do with their names and and it really had to do with the way they would write them really so instead of writing pam p-a-m she would write it p-a-m-e and call it and he would call her pammy okay and then greg would write his with double g so a- after getting married pam and greg they settled in Derry, new hampshire population around 30,000 they're starting their life off and and this is a pretty nice area you know nice residential area two-story condo and they're renting this place and it's got you know all new furniture and it's just it's uh, you know a really nice place so they're living the life yeah two young people starting their careers nice condo furnished two cars two cars they got a dog so they even named their dog Halen after the famous rock band Van Halen. And the other thing is where they moved was just a block away from Greg's parents. So, oh, so he could go home and, I mean, j- just go visit his parents or oh, his yeah. two brothers anytime he wanted. Yeah. He yeah. had a couple of brothers. I think I said before he had one brother, but I yeah, erred. I don't remember. Yeah, but he, yeah, he's got He's, he's got, got a couple two. brothers. Yeah. They got the infrastructure. They got a nice place to live. Support system nearby. Right. Everything seems to be going great. Yeah. But it doesn't last very long. And the trouble starts up not that long after they're married. Yeah, like six months, seven months or something like that. Right. And and a lot of it is because Greg starts to change. The big change, which I think for her is, is that he changes his look. He cuts that lovely mane of hair that you were just talking about. It was glorious. But you're right. He he does become more conservative. Part of that is cutting his hair. You know, he becomes an insurance salesman. So I'm sure that was a big part of it. He wanted to look the part. Yeah. I mean, he even changes his wardrobe, right? I mean, yeah. He's got to, he's got to look like the salesman. He can't go out there and tight, tight pants and rock and roll shirts and things like yeah, that. Yeah. He can't so. walk around like you do, but um, yeah. <laughs> you know, he does have to create this image right. so that he can be a successful insurance salesman. Yeah. And, and by all accounts, he was, he was doing well. But he wasn't into rock music anymore. I mean, not that he probably didn't listen to it, but he wasn't playing. Well, right? he, he was he was growing up, right? I mean, he's being an, a, a, an adult, and he's got bills to pay, so he's out there doing what he has to do. I think it's what most of us did. Right. Right? We were into X until we had to grow up and be into right. Y. Nothing wrong with still loving your heavy metal. Yeah. You know, bang your head all you want, but you can't do that when you're trying to make money at, in the insurance business like he was trying to do. Yeah, I agree. So you touched on it that this was a big deal for Pam. And it was said by friends that Pam thought that Greg had gone from looking like, you know, Bon Jovi to some yuppie. And she didn't like that. Didn't turn her on. Because she fell in love with this guy that was, you know, dangerous and had the rocker look. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not even to their first anniversary. They're starting to have serious problems. And as they get close to their first anniversary, then they have a real problem. Because that's when Greg confesses to Pam that he had an affair. Yeah. He he went looking for attention because he wasn't getting it at home. Yep. And again, was that because she was not happy with him, not attracted to him? Could have been. Who knows? I don't know all the details. I mean, obviously, I'm not condoning what he did. No, not in not, any way. No, not blaming her either. 
because he did that, right? It, it's just that, unfortunately, this happens in marriages. And the pro- yeah, the problem with with it was is that it just started everything down a really bad path. So every time they would get in an argument, it was said that she would bring up the affair and she even testifies later at trial. I think that, um, you know, she just didn't feel important from that point on. She had no trust in Greg, which I I don't blame her. No, I get that 100%. An affair kind of really has a big effect on the whole trust level. Yeah. I don't know how you forget about it. But at this point, I think she's already made the decision that she wants out of this marriage. But she doesn't tell Greg that, I don't believe. I agree with that, too. And I think that's with with a lot of couples, right? They try to, tr- they try to trudge through it or try to yeah, break through they it. they try to get through it. Whatever or, you want to call or it. Or they try to find a way to get the other spouse to initiate because they don't want to be the one that initiates it. Uh, yeah, I think that's so they, a valid point, I don't know too. They, I'm going to call it sabotage, but they find ways to try to make that happen. They don't so they're not be, the bad ones. Yeah, they don't want to be as the one seen as having left. Right. They almost want to force the other into leaving. I don't know that to be the case, but I mean... Oh, I think that's... That happens. I think that happens a lot. For sure. We talked about Pam and school, and you know she had gone for broadcasting, and she really wanted to do something in broadcasting. And she ends up getting a job as the media services director with the school board in Hampton, New Hampshire. Now, this is not what she had in mind, right? I think broadcasting, she was thinking, I'm going to work at a television station or, you know, because even in the movie that they make, right, To Die For with Nicole Kidman, right. they, they they change it around a little bit. And she is like a, is she a weather weather yep. person? Weather reporter. Yeah. Yeah. But that is, I think, what Pam aspired to be not a, a, whether it was weather or re, on the meteorologist or yeah. a reporter or something like that. But she ends up taking this job. Now keep in mind, she's only at this point, what, 22, 23, 22, 22 years yeah. old. Now what she was required to do in this job was basically distribute, produce educational type videos that would be used throughout the school district. This was not like some, high paying job. I don't believe, right. but she had her own secretary and she, the job even came with an intern, a student intern. Yeah. And that's going to play a big role as we move down, the as line. we move down the line. Pam was into this job. You know, this is uh Winnicunit high school and she was volunteering as an adult facilitator for local drug awareness programs and this is kind of where things really start to turn south because it's part of this drug awareness program, which was called Project Self-Esteem, that she meets a student named Billy Flynn, William Flynn, but he went by Billy. Billy. This is the fall of 1989. Their relationship kind of blossoms from working together on this project self-esteem and then continues in some kind of orange juice video competition. I don't know if you had that Gibbs, but they were, Yeah, I, did. I guess they were supposed to make a video that would be sent to or entered into some type of competition for like the orange growers association or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So we talked about Greg's confessed his affair and this has caused her to push away And she starts spending time with this high school student. He's 15 years old named Billy. So Gibbs, you've got a 22 year old teacher that all of the boys in school thought was attractive. Yes. And and I'm wondering because her dog was named Halen, their favorite, which means maybe her favorite band was Van Halen. I think one, maybe one of theirs was, I don't know if it was one of their top song was. Hot for, Hot teacher. for teacher. I wondered if I she did not put that, felt she was living that role. I did not put two and two together. But I could that's, do that little drum roll that begins the song. That's but. why we keep you around, to make those kind of connections. Right. That's what I'm doing. You got to have those connections. Right. It ties everything together. That's a Gibby Connect. 
So I think at this point, Gibbs, I want to talk about Billy because obviously he is a central figure in this case. As we mentioned, he's 15 years old, sophomore in high school. We already know that he's attracted to Pam Smart. Yeah. And one thing about Billy is that he loved heavy metal. And if you look at his pictures, he kind of looks like like a young Paul McCartney a little bit in the face. That's that's what I got from it. But he had he had the hair. Yeah, he did. Now it wasn't the same type of mane that Greg had, but I think he came off as to Pam what Greg was four years ago. Yes. Would you agree, I with, agree that? with that? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he wore a black leather jacket. He loved heavy metal. His favorite band was Motley Crue. And I think she was attracted to him. I don't want to say from the get go, but very, very early on. I agree. I mean, and that drove her to spend more time with him because yeah. she liked that attraction. But right. yeah, he had the look that she has always said she's been attracted to. Yes. There's and no she, doubt and about it. And she didn't have it at home anymore. Billy Flynn was born March 12th, 1974. He had a little bit tougher upbringing, I think. His his parents' relationship was described as tumultuous, and they argued all the time. And it was said that you know he was kind of caught in the middle, having to listen to all these arguments. So in 1986, a big event happens in Billy's life. His mom catches his dad cheating, finds out that I guess he's been cheating on her for a long time. She decides to leave him and they're in California and move all the way from California to New Hampshire. That's a big move. That's a long way. Yeah. So Billy enters junior high. He's 12 years old when he gets to New Hampshire. And by all accounts, his mother would say from that point forward, Billy was very angry. I don't know if it was solely related to this traumatic event or the big move, the big move, whatever father it figure, was. Right. But they moved to a place called Seabrook, and this is where Billy would meet his best friends. And it's important because his best friends come into the picture and ultimately play a role in the whole case. Yeah. So in Seabrook, you know, like I said, this is where Bill meets his two best friends. So it's Bill and Patrick Randall, who goes by Pete, and you've got Vance. La Time, Moore's Day in the Time. That's right. And they called him JR because he was a junior. Yeah. Basically. That makes sense. But these guys were like they formed this really close bond. They did everything together. They shoveled snow, just everything they could do. But they even helped out, like it was said they helped out elderly residents with free services like shoveling snow. And I mean, so Seem like nice guys. At some point in time, they were doing some really nice things. So we'll talk a little bit about Jr. And and we'll just talk about these folks because they do play, you know, a part in this whole story. But Jr. was kind of like a bookworm. And he was into like Edgar Allan Poe. He had an old Camaro that he was fixing up. And his dream was to become a Marine. But again, it was said that when he had free time... He was either visiting his grandmother or he was helping at his church to serve dinner to people that were less fortunate. I mean, people really said some nice things about him. Yeah, sounds like he was just a good kid. That's everything I read. Then you talk about Pete. His mom said, you know, he's a very loving son, but now... Of the three of them, he was the one that probably got in the most trouble as a youngster. He didn't like to go to school, so he would skip a lot and was truant. There was even a rumor floating around that he had told somebody that his goal in life was to become a hitman. That's that's a that's a big uh... red flag. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I would say it is, given the fact that we, you know, what is about to come. Right. I would say that that is a real big red flag. But again, you've got teachers talking about the three of these kids as impressive young men, genuinely likable and caring. And they were all three described as intelligent. Yeah. 
So I think they had a lot of things going for them. And then as we're going to talk about events unfold, but before we get there, we have to talk about the intern. Now I mentioned that Pam's job came with the student intern. Her name was Cecilia Pierce, also from Seabrook. She was 15 years old. She really became like really good friends with Pam. Now, keep in mind, Pam's going through this tough stretch in her marriage. She's found out that that Greg had an affair. And Cecilia, it was said, you know, had never had a friend like Pam because Pam's pretty, she's intelligent, she's self-assured. Yeah. And she made Cecilia feel super extra important just by being around her. Right. Which people can do. Oh, absolutely. You know, people that are really have this magnetic personality. I mean, you can feel better just by being around them. Being in the same room. Right. Like you feel totally better right now because you're sitting across from me. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) You know, the other thing is Pam's making money. So she's taking Cecilia out. She's paying for dinner. They're doing stuff. She she even lets... Let's her drive her car. Yeah. Which, I mean, for a 15-year-old? Yeah. You know, driving that new Honda CRX right. or whatever it was called back then, you know, she, you know, she thinks this is cool. You know, I'm getting to drive my teacher's car. But this friendship between the two of them, it starts to show on the people in Cecilia's life, right? She starts changing. Mm-hmm. Cecilia's mom's not liking it at all. Her daughter's acting different. Well, it goes from being a mentor really fast to be in like BFFs. Yeah. So Cecilia's grades are starting to drop. And at one point her mom even goes to the school and says, you know, this is not right that a teacher would spend time with a 15 year old student outside of school. The assistant principal says, yeah, I noticed that too, but then they don't do anything about it. Right. Yeah, so they acknowledge it. They acknowledge it, but they don't do anything about it. And that's a theme that that you and I talk about in a lot of cases. Yeah. Now, usually that theme is based on much like severe crimes that people aren't punished for as much as they should be. Right. But again, this is something that somebody should have noticed or I mean they did notice it, but sh- somebody should have taken more action. She's hanging out with Cecilia, but then she starts hanging out with Bill too. It's the three of them, you know, and they're going to the mall. They're going to restaurants. And this is at the, the, they're still working on this video project. Like we talked about. And it's at this point that Pam starts inviting them over to her condo. Okay. When Greg's out of town to work on this project. Now at one point, Greg goes out of town for some type of work related conference or something. And she has Bill and Cecilia over to watch movies. And the movie happens to be nine and a half weeks. And Probably not a proper movie to well, view hell with no. your student. Not with 15 year old kids. But yeah. back then that movie was considered very racy. Yeah. Risque. Risque. That's a good word. Risque. Pam asked Cecilia to walk the dog. And this is when she gets Billy up to her room yep. and they have sex for the first time. They were blasting, you know, heavy metal, you know, while they had sex. And, and I mean, is that a detail? It's just part of the story that she's trying to, I think she's trying to channel this back to what she's into. Exactly. Right. This is what Greg was when she met him. He's changed. Now I found a replacement. And the replacement's really into her. Oh, yeah. And why wouldn't he? I mean, The problem is he's 15 he's years 15. old. Right. That's the problem. Right. If she'd have found a, a 22-year-old replacement... It'd be a different story. It'd be a different story. Right. They start having sex pretty regularly after this point. It's not too long after this first encounter that they start to talk about getting rid of Greg. Because basically, Pam is telling Billy... If we don't get rid of Greg, we can't keep seeing each other. Now, we're basing this on the testimony of people at the trial. Right. Now, this is not what Pam says. This is what 
other people say. say. And yeah. we're going to hear some of that. Now, at some point, Bill asked Pam about, you know, why don't you just get a divorce? And the answer from Pam is that Greg would take everything. She wouldn't have any money. And this is going to come up later at trial from several different people. She would lose the condo and everything. And according to some of the testimony, it's at this point that she starts to say that Greg's been beating her. And the only way to get out of it and to be with Billy is to kill him. So Gibbs, they, this is where they start talking about and planning the murder of Greg Smart. Because if he wants to be with her, Greg's got to be out of the way. Correct. And of course, we know his infatuation for her is, is just off the charts. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt, right? This kid's 15 years old. I'm assuming... He's with a hot teacher. And, and maybe I'm assuming incorrectly that this may was probably his first sexual experience. I'm sure he's in love with Pam Smart at this point. Yes. And would probably do anything to make sure that that doesn't end. They have a number of discussions about what to do. And now Billy's involved. JR's involved. Pete's involved in the beginning Mm -hmm. of these discussions. But they basically settle on a very basic plan outlined by Pam. And that is basically that they're going, the boys are going to wear dark clothes. They're going to tie their long metal rock band hair back. So part of the plan involves Pam leaving the rear doors open. This is going to allow Bill and Pete to enter the condo, make it look like a robbery, take some stuff, you know, that, that kind of thing. Some, any electronics, jewelry, stuff like that. But there's three things that Bill instructs his friends that they have to follow. Number one is don't turn on any lights. The second one is don't hurt the dog, Halen. Pam wants him to put Halen in the basement so he doesn't have to witness the murder. Doesn't want Halen traumatized. Right. Yeah. She's looking out for the dog. Right. And the third one is use a gun and not a knife because a knife is too messy. Because according to Billy, Pam doesn't want to get any blood on her white leather couch. I mean, this is very detailed. You know, descriptions that she's telling them, instructions, right? I mean, she's giving very detailed instructions, how to do it, very controlling instructions. Well, we talked about... Her OCD-ish. Yeah, she's a con- she has control yeah. issues. So, again, if you were to go on the theory that she did not do this, these people are making up some really super specific instructions. And... The concern was more about the dog not being traumatized and the white couch not being, you know, not being soiled versus. Then her husband. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She's got no concern for him, but watch out for the dog. And don't get the couch dirty. And don't get blood on my couch. Yeah. I mean, the boys even state that at one point Pam is talking with them and trying to figure out how is she going to act when she discovers Greg's body. Should she scream, call for help, you know, run out into the street, bang on a neighbor's house? I mean, they're giving a lot of detail that, you know, is going to come up in trial later on. So we get to May 1st of 1990. So Pam and Greg leave the house for work. Greg leaves first. Pam after him. Now, Pam had a school board meeting scheduled for that night. And apparently it was supposed to run pretty late. They were having a salary review and some discussions about some things that were going to occur in the fall. So her thought was that she was not going to get home until well after Greg was dead. Right. So this goes into the, the planning part of it. Now that day, by all accounts, Pam dropped by Billy's locker to inform him that the doors, she had left the doors open, like they talked about, everything was ready to go. One thing I found very interesting, Gibbs, is that it was said that she had on basically every piece of jewelry that she owned. 
She was wearing like all of her gold chains. She had a ring on every finger. She blinged. Right, but why would she do that? Maybe that's how she's going to account for the robbery not taking them. Right, she doesn't want them to take her jewelry. Right. So she's going to wear everything she owns. And that's how she's going to account for it not being missing. Yes, because if not, then she's not going to be able to wear it later on because it's going to have to be stolen, thrown away, yeah, and we pawned, know, whatever. We know she's, it's all about her and image. So at some point later in that day, Gibbs, Billy calls Pam to say that there's a little snag in the plan because they need a ride to go pick up the getaway car, which is supposed to be JR's grandmother's yellow Impala from like 1978. Okay. And Pam agrees to take them to go get it. Now we jump forward in time. We're a little bit before 830. And we've got JR, and now we've got a new guy, Raymond Fowler. Yeah. That's brought into the plan. These two are, I guess, what you'd call the getaway drivers. Yeah, the lookout and the getaway. Lookout and getaway drivers. They're parked. Billy Flynn and Pete Randall, they enter the condo and they find the dog. And by all accounts, they have a hard time getting this dog under control. They got to chase the dog around. They finally get it and they throw the dog down the stairs of the basement. They ransack the house. They, you know, they're making it look like a robbery. Now, one thing that they do is they, they take this pair of stereo speakers and they set it by the door because they're wanting to take them as they leave. Kind of like the setup. Right. Now they're staging themselves. Yeah. So, so they, you, speakers and I, heard, I read that they had even put a little TV out there too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you've got Billy is behind the door and you have Pete on the stairway. Greg turns the key. He enters the house. He turns on the light and he's calling out for the dog. Dog doesn't come. And this is where Billy kind of leaps on him ambushes him Pete jumps in so you got you know two kids on him he's overpowered at some point they make Greg hand over his billfold and then Pete asks for his wedding band yes and by all accounts he says I cannot do that my wife would kill me so now we have Billy he's got the gun to Greg's head he says God forgive me he squeezes the trigger. The gun goes off. Greg falls to the floor. I cocked the hammer back and um, pointed the gun at his head. A hundred years, it seemed like. And uh, I said, um, God, forgive me. God forgive me. What happened? I pulled the trigger. So that was court testimony from Billy Flynn, which I wanted to play now versus when we're talking at trial because he's actually talking about yeah. the point in time where he kills Greg. Yeah, I think it was important to play that. Yeah. So both boys run out of the condo. They get in the getaway car and they take off. Yeah. Meanwhile, Greg's dead. You know, he's just been shot with a 38 caliber hollow point right behind his left ear. You know, the slug goes in and does its damage and then lodges inside the skull. It just took one shot. Just one shot. So when they, when they move the body, they, they find, Underneath him, the wallet, the billfold that Billy asked for, never took that with him. And they also find the car keys and they find the uh, diamond studded wedding band still on uh, Greg's finger. So around 10, between 10 and 10 30, Pam comes home. She comes in the front door. She flicks on the foyer light and she sees Greg laying there. So Pam yells, help my husband, my husband. 
And then frantically she goes from door to door in the, in the condo building she, she's in, knocking on the doors, ringing the doorbells, just trying to get anybody's attention. One of the neighbors comes out and she screams, my husband's hurt, he's on the floor. She says, I don't know what's wrong with him. The neighbor says it was strange that after she says, I don't know what's wrong with him, she then says something strange. She says, why do they keep doing this? That was her words. Why did they keep doing yeah. this? Why do they keep doing this? Do we ever find out what she was referencing what happened before? No. Yeah, man, I'd really love to know. Because I could see why a neighbor would say that's very strange if she's not adding the additional information of what they were doing before, right? Or was that just part of her setting up kind of... Because obviously, if she's in on this, as everybody is saying she is, right? she's doing some play acting. Yeah, she's setting the script, the scene or right. so something. Is, is that part of the setup saying, why do they keep doing this to make it seem like somebody had been harassing them right. and now they finally... Took Car- it to the next level. Right, carried through and, and took it to the final step. So with, with, because she's going door to door, you know, eventually she, she gets a lot of the neighbors coming out and two of the neighbors call 911. So finally the police have been notified and they're on their way. There is this one neighbor, Art Hughes, and he's he comes out and he says, what's wrong? And then she, again, she's saying, my husband's on the floor. And he's asking her, what's wrong with him? You know, where, where, you know, actually, where is he, you know, when I go inside? And he, he's trying to go inside. And she's like, don't go inside. They could still be in there. And he's trying to say, let me go in there and see if I can assist. Help him. Right. Because. Right? And then, she, again, she's saying, don't go in there. They could be in there. So Gibbs, the, the police show up. They're processing the scene like they would do. Obviously, they're talking to Pam, and a couple of things come out, I believe. You know, there's one detective that makes a statement at some point that they believe pretty early on, I think, that this robbery was staged. They do, Mike, because they think that some things look cleaner than they should be, like somebody went back and did more than they probably should have, if that makes like, sense. Yeah, I think like went overboard, yes. right? Like went like a 15 year old would do if they thought they were trying to stage a burglary. Right. Yeah. And that's the only way I can say it. So some areas they went overboard on the, on making sure it looked nice and neat and other areas they overdid, you know, and I think we, we talked about how they, you know, took a couple of speakers and a TV and set it out back by the uh, back door that didn't add up to the police that why would they, not take them. Take those, unless someone was trying to make it look like it was a, a robbery that got interrupted when he came home, and they and they shot him and, and ran off. So the other part is, as they're talking to Pam, I think some of the detectives also think that she's putting on an act. Yes, they do. That 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 comes out as well. So I think we have to jump forward into the you know they're investigating this. And it's about two weeks into the investigation that the lead detective, uh, whose name is Pelletier, he gets an anonymous tip. It's a female caller that's providing this tip that basically says she named Cecilia Pierce, right? Cecilia was the intern we talked about. And the tip is that Cecilia knew about and planned with Pam Smart and the three teenage boys, Greg's murder. That's a pretty good tip. That's a really good tip. Then on Sunday, June 10th, J.R. Sr., so J.R.'s dad, brings in a snub-nosed 38 to the police station, and he believes that this is the pistol that may have been the murder weapon. So I would say, you know, within a short period of time... The police have two pretty good tips. Yeah. And even he mentions Cecilia to the police as well. So now now they've heard her name twice. So Pam Smart is smack dab on police radar. Yeah. 
They're starting to zero in on her. So the very next day, the police go to talk to Cecilia, but it's not until about three or four days later that she really breaks down and tells them everything. At this point, you know, they're talking to the boys too, but the boys are not talking. They're kind of stonewalling, except for Raymond Fowler, because he's already caved and he's already written out an affidavit saying exactly what he did. So right now they have Fowler's affidavit. They have Pierce's basically confession slash account of everything that happened. But that's really not enough. They need more. It's a lot, but they need more if they're going to tie Pam Smart and the others to the murder. And they have the smoking gun. Well, they, yeah, they do have the smoking gun. But I, I think at this point they're trying to slam dunk this thing. Well, because you're right. Because they even though they have the gun and ballistics showed that that was the gun used, but the gun was wiped so clean they couldn't lift any prints. So... They have a gun, but if you can't determine who, who pulled the trigger. Right. And even even if it's it's JR's gun. Yeah. So let's say he's involved. They still have nothing to tie Pam, who I think at this point they're starting to think masterminded this whole thing. Right. So this is when they had they come up with the idea that they're gonna wire Cecilia in a couple different ways. They're gonna tap her phone. And they're going to have her call Pam. And then also they're, they're going to do an actual body wire and have Cecilia talk to Pam in person. And the crazy thing about this is, and I wanted it so bad. I want the tapes are out there, but it's a, it's just a mess. You cannot hear it at all. And even at trial, I'll say even at trial, it, it proved to be a, an issue, right? They had to literally play it numerous times. They had to have, the jury wear headphones. They had to give a transcript of what they thought it was. I think you could interpret it one way. If you wanted to hear something, you could say that's what you heard, but you could also say you didn't hear anything. It's it's how bad the quality was. Yeah. And they even had experts try to, you know, bump it up. Yeah. And she would even argue much later in life that, she couldn't afford during her trial that type of expert to analyze the tapes and have them thrown out. What they do get from the tapes is really damning evidence. Yeah, I think so. And and it's, in a nutshell, Pam admitting that she knew ahead of time that she was part of it. At the end of one of the taped conversations... Pam invites Cecilia over to her house later so they can go out. And Pam makes a joke at the end and says, well, you'd better be there or I'll come after you with a Rambo knife. Now, she said it as a joke yeah. and it wasn't a K bar. This may be one where you're not actually a suspect. 1990. Yeah, you were pretty young. Yeah, well, not that young. Have you ever been to New Hampshire? Abs- no, I have no. not. I'm clear. Okay. Thank you. You're clear in this one. Mm-hmm. We'll have to wait for the next one. But that's a new segment on true crime all the time. Is Gibby a suspect or not? (laughs) And in this case, we're saying no. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's go to August 1st, 1990. And this is when during the middle of the day, detective Pelletier goes into Pam Smart's office. Now she knows him because she's talked to him a bunch of times. They've questioned her all All that. And Pelletier says, you know, Pam, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is we've solved your husband's murder. The bad news is you're under arrest. And that's basically what starts the circus, the trial, the everything, media, the media frenzies, on everything that is to follow. Now we've talked about some of the trial and we had to in trying to, you know, connect the dots. So Gibbs, I, I want to play this clip of Alan Dershowitz, and most people recognize that name. He was part of the, would later be part of the uh, OJ defense team. 
it's not going to be easy. But uh, this is a case where... <laughs> Has she every, called yet? No, no. Okay. Where everything turns on matters of degree. Now, it's obvious that the kid killed because he believed that she wanted the man dead. But that's not enough for conviction. There has to be very specific directions by Pamela to the young man to kill. And if she can persuade a jury or cast some doubt in their minds as to whether maybe he didn't act on his own on the basis of some subtle cues she may have given, but maybe she misunderstood and misinterpreted, there's a possible route out, particularly when you combine that with the fact that these kids have been given deals and the actual killer uh, has been given a plea bargain and the defense attorney can, I think, and did a fairly effective job in trying to show how he would have in his interest to twist the, the truth and make it come out black and white where it may be a little grayer. But hasn't she undermined that, that first course of your defense by saying, no, we never discussed it, she never imagined that Bill Flynn could have done this? Well, no, I think it's consistent for her to say we never discussed it, although the tape uh, suggests something maybe a little bit different. We never discussed it, although we discussed the fact that, you know, I loved him, I wanted to be with you, he was a barrier to me being with you, I couldn't love two people at the same time. She can take the position that we never had a specific discussion about killing and yet suggests that there were discussions which could have led him as an impressionable young man to honestly believe that she wanted him dead, but uh, wrongly in, in, in his view. But she's already suggested it never occurred to her until after he was arrested that she might even have a lawyer. She'd have to backtrack a bit. Well, and the tape hurts her on that, too, because on the tape, she does seem to say that she knew it was going to happen in advance. She now says she was playing games. That was the weakest part of her otherwise fairly credible testimony. She seems quite persuasive. Now, the prosecutor, of course, can turn that against her. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if this woman has persuaded you, you can imagine how much more persuasive she would have been to this young, impressionable boy. So, I mean, Alan Dershowitz kind of sums it up, right? He talks about Pam's testimony, which we've got some clips of we'll play, and her testimony was good. Really good. I mean, for a 22, 23 years old, however she was at the time. Either she was extremely well coached she came off really well. Very well. And you hear Alan talking about some of the different tactics that the defense would use. And it's basically that, and Pam admits to the sex, right? She admits to the affair, you know, the sexual indiscretion with Billy. But what she will not admit to is telling Billy to kill Greg. Right. So the whole defense is basically that Billy was in love with her. He did this on his own. Yeah, he did this so he could have her for himself. Right. But that she was not controlling him or telling him to do this, that he just took it that way that he had to to do it. That's right. Now, the trial only lasted 14 days. Yeah, it was a fast... I mean, in today's standard, it was a really fast trial. Yeah, I mean, for as much media circus and everything that went around it, it wasn't one of these trials that dragged on, you know, for months and months. What I think is, you know, Billy's testimony was probably riveting, right? Because we already played some of it, but he actually gets down in the middle of the courtroom before the jury kneels down and he actually is showing them what he did that night. And that's when he says, you know, I cocked the hammer back, pointed the gun to his head, said, oh God, you know, please forgive me. And then I pulled the trigger. Well, let's hear a little bit from Pam because we've talked about Pam. Did there ever come a point in time when you did kiss Bill Clinton? Yes, I did. What happened between this uh, February 5th when you told him that you couldn't have an affair at that point in time? What changed? My feelings. I... Oh, describe it. Well, I didn't set out to have an affair with him, but I did. You said... <coughs> You told Cecilia Pierce on June 13, 1990, that you knew about the murder. Yes. And that was a total fabrication on your part in order to try and get Cecilia Pierce to talk, correct? I told her that I had known about it beforehand, which was a fabrication. And that's what you wanted her to know so you might be able to get information from Cecilia Pierce. Yes. And you now know, testify, that Cecilia Pierce went to the police on June 14th, June 15th, and gave them all sorts of information on this case, correct? Yes. And as you sit here today, you know 
that the information the city of Pierce gave to the police on June 14th and June 15th inculpated, inculpated you in this crime? Yes. So now, testifying before this jury, you say to us, the day before I told Cecilia Pierce, I was involved writing about the murder before, right? Right. And is that the first time you ever told Cecilia Pierce that you had anything to do with the murder? I didn't tell her that I had something to do with it. I told her that I, I had known about it. My plan was originally when the day started to get more information from her. And by the time the day was over, she had told me that she was scared and that she was going to go to the police. And she was. So you Bill had done it. Right. Okay. And I'm al almost finished. And she had told me that she was going to the police and she was going to tell them that we, meaning she and I, knew about the murder beforehand. And of course, I automatically panicked because I didn't want her to do that. So my intention from there on out was to try and talk her out of going to the police. So why didn't you go to the police before and straighten the whole mess out? Why didn't you go to the police and say, hey, you know, I, I was just talking to Cecilia. Oh my God, she knows Bill, this kid did it. I was wrong from the beginning. I'm really embarrassed about my affair. Please don't tell anybody about it. But now you can solve the murder of your, my husband. And now you can tell the smart how her son died. Now you can tell the world how this senseless thing has a sense to it. But you didn't go to the police on June 13th after talking to Cecilia, correct? Because I was scared, I was afraid, and I had heard rumors that I was going to be arrested, and I was afraid, yes. So I hate the fact that the audio is so bad, but I, I think it's necessary to hear her testify because, like we talked about, she comes off pretty good. Yeah, and she's actually pretty, pretty controlling of the uh, of what she's saying. I mean, she's even telling them at one point, you know, when they tried to interrupt her, "Hold on, I'm almost finished." Right? I mean, you got to remember, she's 22. Right? I mean, this is a you know up for murder, 22, and she's handling it really extremely well. I mean, I think at that age. I'd be pissing in my granimals. Yeah, I mean, you can still wear granimals. So. I do, but I don't want to make too much out of it. But when you hear that, she really does come off as convincing. Now, she's trying to say that, yeah, I because she said those things on the tape, right? But now she's trying to backtrack and say, well, the reason I said them was because I was trying to get her trust. I was trying to get more information out of right. her. And I just, you know, the jury's not going to buy that. Everyone was screaming, how come no one's doing anything? And a policeman came down the stairs and he said, because he's dead. Well, I didn't set out to have an affair with him, but I did. Props were suggested by the kinky video movie, Nine and a Half Weeks. Did you take walk down? Yes. Did you do the thing with the ice cubes? No. I think he's having a problem remembering where reality began and the movie stopped. Bill Flynn said he was hooked, but that it was she who bought the bullets and hatched the plot that killed her husband. Do you want this jury to understand that Bill Flynn decided to kill your husband because you broke up with him? I want this jury to understand the truth. Is that what you're claiming the truth is? I don't know why Bill Flynn killed Greg. I can just come in here and give my testimony. So even as you sit here today, you still have no idea why he may have done this. Is that it? I have not. I didn't say I had no idea, but I don't know specifically. Well, I'm asking you, what do you think? Why do you think he did this? Probably because he thought we could be together. In this one here, you can really get a feeling how well composed she is. I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean she's not stammering. I mean, she has an answer for every question. Yeah. I mean, for again, and I, I know I'm harping on it for 22 years old, and maybe there's people out there saying, "Well, she should. She's 22. That's that's a you know, she's educated and she should be able to do this." But unless you've been in, involved in a lot of uh, trials and depositions and things like that, it's nerve wracking. It, it is nerve wracking, and, and you normally don't have that type of uh, composure, especially if your life is on the line, right? I mean, if you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life it, it, you, you think that she would be more more rattled and she's not yeah and, and again she is facing life in prison 
all the teenagers are testifying against her because they've all secured plea bargains. Yeah. You know, and I think Dershowitz even talked about it in his case about, you know, and I think you and I maybe have covered it on other episodes where, you know, when you have a plea bargain, sometimes the jury looks at that as guilt, a form of guilt. Or, or that the people that are get, getting the plea bargains are turning against somebody else so that they can get off yeah. with, with a lighter sentence. I think sometimes it's it's looked at. The perception of it? Yeah, the yeah. perception is that. This jury didn't see it that way. No. And we and we know the, the rest of the world didn't see it that way either. No, I, I think the public perception was completely against Pam. Yes. I, I don't think there's much question about that. And, and again, people watch this trial. So unlike most trials or all trials before this, they didn't just get to see what the media was feeding them. They got to see the inner workings of a real trial, you know, the evidence, the testimony. I mean, they got to see it. Yeah. And there was a lot of people that watched it probably gavel to gavel and, Oh, we know they did. And I mean, in, in, you know, Pamela argues to this day that she's sitting in prison because the media was the one that actually convicted her. So the 14 day trial's over. The jury comes back. They find her guilty on March 22nd, 1991. Accomplice to first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and witness tampering. Now, she could have been charged with capital murder, even though we know she didn't pull the trigger. But the prosecution decided against that as she was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility for parole. So, I mean, that's a, you know, short of the death sentence. I mean, that's as much as you can get. So, Gibbs, everybody does prison time, right? Except for one person, and that's Cecilia. And I think that's in large part to her, due to her cooperation with the wiretapping of her phone, wearing the the body wire and getting all this evidence. Right. So Billy Flynn is sentenced to life in prison for second degree murder. He's eligible for parole after 40 years, but he only has a 12 year minimum sentence. So I I don't know. It's a little strange, right? A lot of that depends on whether he, you know, his behavior in prison. Flynn was a a really a model prisoner. You know, he got his GED because you got to remember the kid was 15 years old. He didn't finish high school. Right. So he gets his GED and, and while he's in prison, he was an electrician, did a lot of charity work. Now, 2007, He'd been in prison for 16 years. He tried to get his sentence reduced and the smart family definitely opposed that. They did not want him out and that was ultimately denied. But what they did do is they reduced his earliest parole eligibility date to 25 years. So that would make him making him eligible for parole in 2015. And ultimately he was paroled March 12th, 2015. Although he didn't get out of prison until June, I think. Yeah, it was the like first week of June is when they finally released him. But there's a couple things about this I, I want to play. So first, I've got Billy Flynn in his actual parole hearing. I just wanted to take this time to say that uh, I will always feel terrible about what happened 25 years ago. Parole will not change that. The regret and responsibility I feel are a part of me, not conditional upon where I reside. And the administration at the Boulder Correctional Facility have been working very closely with me to help make the transition back into society. And I feel that I'm ready. So that was Billy. He was actually on the phone. He had to, they had to call him or he had to call. I don't know how it worked, but. And then I have a clip I want to play, and this is Greg's brother, who was actually in attendance at Billy's parole hearing. No matter how hard we fight, no one can change what happened that night. And no one can bring Greg back, because you decided to take his life away. I just hope you have learned some things from this epic mistake, 
I hope you don't fall into the media circus that Pam has created from all of this when you are free. You've served your time for the most part very privately and quietly, and I respect that because we as a family do not need to keep living this over and over again. You know, I mean, I guess for me, that would be a very tough situation. But Greg's brother showed a lot of uh, grace, I guess I would call it. So Pete Randall Gibbs also got life in prison, second degree murder. Pretty much the same exact sentence as Billy got. 40 parole in 40 years, 12 years deferred. He was eligible for parole in 2018, but he also got his sentence reduced in 2009 and was ultimately paroled in 2015. Now he got, these are lifetime paroles though. So anything that they would do to violate parole would send them back to prison immediately. Yes. For depending on what they did. Yeah. For however long it could be years or life or life. I don't know. Yeah. Just depends on the nature of the crime. Right. Yeah. So Jr. he got life in prison as an accomplice to second degree murder. He was eligible for parole in 30 years, 12 years suspended. So he was eligible in 2008. Again, his got reduced by three years as well, and he was paroled in 2005. Raymond Fowler, if you remember, he was one of the ones that waited in the car. He was sentenced to 30 years for conspiracy to murder and attempted burglary and was eligible for parole after 15 years. Fowler got out in 2003, but he was one, Gibbs, that actually violated his parole and had to go back the very next year, 2004. But it must not have been much of a violation of the parole because he got paroled again in 2005. So he only spent another year in, in prison. Now I do want to say one last thing, and that's about Cecilia Pierce. Apparently she got quite a bit of money for the screen rights to her story. Cause remember she didn't spend any time in jail. Right. And I'm not sure which movie it was. Cause there was, there's been an, and something we didn't talk about. There's been a number of movies made about the Pamela smart story, right? We did mention the one with Nicole Kidman. There was another one made uh, pretty soon after this all happened that started Helen hunt. So I'm not sure which one of these was, but she got, she got a pretty good chunk of, chunk of change. So now the one thing about Pam is she's not been quiet, right? She's serving life in prison. Yeah. She's done tons of interviews. She still maintains her innocence. So let's hear from Pam. It's hard for people to understand that this really means life. It's a very serious sentence. And to me, honestly, I think it's worse than the death penalty. It is, because the de- even the death penalty has an end. I think forgiveness is a good thing. But why is there no forgiveness for me? I think somewhere psychologically, I didn't want to feel responsible in any way for this horrible crime. But now I've come to a place where I know that my bad choices and my bad decisions contributed to what happened and contributed to Greg's death. I could see why people hate me. I have no problem understanding why people hate me because of everything they've been fed. But it's just, it's just not true. That if I actually had committed this murder and was guilty, that I would probably be released. And because I've maintained my innocence and I will continue to do so, I've been eternally punished for that. Oh, I think about being free every single day. Every day. I definitely dream about it, but I think about it every day. And there's honestly some days where I, I say to myself, oh my God, what if I really never get out of here? You know, what if I die in here? You know, why don't you, why doesn't he just tell the truth? I mean, it's, he's out, it's over for him. You know, tell the truth, but I know that he can't and that he won't. So really, I don't have very much to say to him because he's not, if he tells the truth, his plea bargain is no good anymore. That's how it goes. It's based on truth, his truthful testimony. So if any, he says anything that contradicts anything he said earlier, then his testimony was no longer truthful 
and there goes the deal. I would suggest that you dig deeper into the case if you really want to know more about it because the, the um, deeper that you dig, you'll find more and more that I believe that you would start to question because people, um, a lot of people, very smart people who have a lot of legal knowledge have gone through the case, have gone different, through different aspects of the case and are equally as outraged as, as I am. I, I don't know, Gibbs. I felt like we did a lot of research. Yeah. I don't know what she's referring to. <laughs> yeah. I, again, it's hard to tell in any of these situations, but there was a lot of evidence against her. Now, could could the boys have falsified their testimony to get the plea bargains? It's possible. Oh, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible. But I think if you, I think the overwhelming majority of people believe that Pam Smart is where she's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But there, like we said, there are, there are people out there and there are whole websites devoted to the fact that people believe she's innocent. You can make the argument and that she was railroaded, mm -hmm. but we're not on the jury. So all we do is tell the story, tell the story. You go out there and make your own decision. Yep. And that's the story of Pamela smart. So for Mike and Gibby, stay safe and keep your own time ticking. <laughs>